Hello! Welcome once again to Stuff and Things, where I like to talk about stuff and occasionally even things I'm good for Bradley, and today is a Pleasant Sunday Smoke. And on this Pleasant Sunday Smoke, I will not be doing anything funny, nothing humorous at all, will take place during this Sunday Smoke. Lately, I've been posting some videos that might be a little wacky, a little zany. And everyone's like, oh, ha, 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 that's so funny, Bradley. We love that. Keep it up. Well, I'm putting my foot down right now. Nothing funny in this video whatsoever. I guarantee it. This will be only about facts, only about topics which we can discuss in a serious manner. Number one, last week I was talking about the Dunhill the end of the road for Dunhill, basically. British American Tobacco has said, that's it. We're not producing anymore. Production has stopped. And a lot of us are kind of hopeful, oh, maybe Scandinavian Tobacco Group, which actually makes the blends for BAT. Yeah. Um, BAT, yes. Uh, maybe they'll just release their own versions. They won't call them the Dunhill blends, but they'll make their own. It'll be the same recipes, whatever. And that's all all well and good, and that might be possible, but then we also have to take into account all the FDA deeming regulations, which we've been talking about for months and months and months now. If it is very onerous for a new blend to come out, basically anything after 2007 has to go through a regulatory process. It costs a lot of money. It has to be okayed by the FDA. Even if STG were to decide to put out these blends again, would they bother releasing them in the US because of how difficult and expensive that would be? I don't know. Um, other people are talking about, well, maybe someone will just purchase the rights to release Dunhill blends and they'll purchase the licensing and they'll still use STG to make these blends. And that way that will beat the deeming regulations because most of these blends, a lot of them have been out since 2007. I don't know if that's actually the case. If there is a break in production, so BAT has stopped making them. If there's several month break, someone else takes up the mantle, STG starts making them again for a new licensee or a new license holder. Does that mean that they have to be resubmitted to the FDA? There are a lot of questions. We just don't really know. There are so many weird, complicated Byzantine machinations going on behind the scenes. All we can do is kind of wait and hope. Um, and that's what I'm doing right now. I'm waiting and I'm a hoping. Not funny. I told you. Other things to get through. We have to be quick. Um, this is my first pipe in several days because I had my first cold of the season. I was actually just thinking about how lucky I had been because um, normally I get a couple colds during the winter and I had not had anything, not a hint of sickness all winter long. Of course, I was dealing with, you know, back and leg things and obnoxious shit like that, but no sickness and that was quite pleasant. But I woke up the other day with, with that feeling in the throat. Um, <clears throat> but I do have to say it's been a pretty minor cold, um, not too bad, just a little tired, a little weak, but nothing too horrible. But I just didn't feel like having a pipe. And uh, I was just curious, it's something we talk about a lot, how pipe smoking is a hobby for a lot of us and not a habit. And it was interesting to me, and this happens, you know, on a fairly regular basis where, you know, if you get, you have a sore throat or for whatever reason, you're not going to smoke a pipe for several days. And it's fine. For me, it's totally fine. And when I used to smoke cigarettes years ago, if I couldn't smoke for several days, that would not be fine. I would not be happy about that. And I was just wondering how many of you, maybe you can talk about this in the comments, if you are a pipe hobbyist, is it easy for you to go several days without having a pipe? I think the way people usually indulge in pipe smoking, it doesn't have the same sort of addictive nature that cigarette smoking does. And I think it is easy for most people to go several days, a week, what have you, without having a pipe, without getting all freaked out um, and having horrible cravings. I feel like that. And it's nice, like I'm glad that I'm, I'm having a pipe now. I was looking forward to it, but I didn't have the same sort of like physical visceral response that I would get if when I was a smoker, I couldn't smoke a cigarette. Interesting. Oh, I don't think I told you what I was smoking. It is GLP's Westminster. Reviewed this fairly recently, and I really have to say this has become one of my favorite kind of anytime English blends. Quite nice. In fact, you can tell the tin is pretty much empty. I might have to order some more.
But we have other things that we have to run to. I mentioned a while back, and this has been a long time now, and I feel like a total jerk. A very nice guy, Christoph, I'm going to try to pronounce his last name. Christoph Sherigu, Sherigue, Sherigue, Sheriget, Sheriget, Christoph wrote me an email and said that he would like to send me some of his product. He has a product line called Off Lines, um, based in the EU, and he had some cool notebooks he wanted to send me and asked me if I could do a review, and this was in November, I think, and it took quite a while for them to get to me. It wasn't until kind of late December, and then with the holidays and everything going on, and then also changing my workstation, I got rid of my old desk, and I had, I, my apartment was just a complete disaster. And they kind of got pushed away and I totally forgot about doing the review and then I was going to do it this week and I just realized that maybe there wasn't enough meat on that bone to do a whole video on these notebooks, but I wanted to show them to you. They're really cool. They're called Offlines. Um, I'm going to put some links in the description box below. There is an EU website where if you are in the EU, you can grab them and then I also have a link to an American website. So if you're in the States, you can grab some too. Um, they are the, where did I put them here? The Der Zettelwert. So there are two different notebook styles I have here, or actually three, I guess. Um, the Der Zettelwert Small here, this is in black, and then this is in Sahara. And then this is the medium in black with a pen loop. These, the uh, two black ones have pen loops. This little one does not. Um, but they're these really cool refillable notebooks. When you buy them originally, I have all this information here that I need to keep straight. So the small is an A7 size. It comes with 50 sheets and in America it's nine bucks. Um, I can't remember what it is in euros, but I'll put the website in the description so you guys in the EU can check that out. And so it comes with 50 sheets. The medium is 10 bucks and that comes with 50 sheets as well. But then there are refills for them. So this is a small refill and this is 100 sheets and then a medium refill that is also 100 sheets. So you have this system here. It's a notebook. You can see there's a little elastic band here. It opens up like kind of an old school reporter's notebook or a cop or something. Hey, <laughs> you'll write down. Um, now, wait a minute. Do I have two? Seems like I have two uh, things here. There's two inserts. Oh, is the pen loop a separate insert? I don't know what's going on here. Something's happening. Yeah, I guess the pen loop is a separate part of the insert that you can just place under the elastic. That is interesting. And then, oh, I see. So that makes it so you can put the pen loop either coming out the left or you can flip it over, put it in and have it come out the right. That's cool. Um, so that's how that works. There's an elastic band. You can take out the entire insert if you wish. And then these come with extra elastic bands as well. I don't need one because I have one in this already. Take out the cover page, you pop that inside, and now you have refilled your notebook quite simply and quite easily. It holds together quite well. Oh, that's supposed to go on over the outside, isn't it? Like so. No, oh, no, it's not supposed to go over the outside. I'm figuring this out as I go. So there you go. You have your 100 page insert in there. Cover still closes really nice. I wanted to read you a little bit of information about these. Um, they are refillable, um, handmade in Bavaria, Germany. They have a black denim tag cover. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but apparently you can put them through the wash and they'll be totally fine. The paper inside wouldn't be fine, but the actual cover will be totally fine. Um, they are waterproof. Uh, they don't care about s coffee stains. Survives a ride in the washing machine. Vegan. The paper itself is a cream colored paper. I don't know if that's going to pick up on camera very well. Um, but it is fairly, fairly heavy. Oh, and you can rip it out individually too, which is nice. If you want to grab a piece, you've jotted down a note or something you want to remember, you just yank it out. Um, from Sustainably Managed Forest. Fountain pen friendly. And I have checked that out. In fact, let me just scribble a little bit on here. Yo, yo, yo. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is a medium Lamy 2000. You can see does not bleed through or anything. Quite nice. And I really like these notebooks. I especially like the tiny ones. 
Um, these little babies, they fit so perfectly into a back pocket and you can bend them, you can fold them. They're great. They're great for just like one thing. If you have a notebook where you're like, I wanna just write down, for me, if I was just going to be writing down ideas for stuff and things videos, I could have one of these with me and it's so easy to refill. You don't feel like, a lot of time when I'm writing in my little Midori notebook or my large Midori, I feel like what I'm writing in there has to be worth writing, if that makes any sense, because this is, the refills are a little more expensive. Um, and I don't know, this just seems like this, like a premium thing where I have to sort of curate what's inside it. But this is just like, screw it. I'll scribble something down. I can rip that page out. The refills, how much were the refills? I have them written down here somewhere. Um, the small 100 sheet refill is six bucks. So not super cheap, but you get a few of these. They're gonna last you quite a while, 100 pages. So you can just jot something down, rip it out, be done with it. It's nice. I like these quite a bit. I think it's a cool system. I really like the way they are sort of flexible, refillable. You have your little pen loop with this tiny little ballpoint pen twist like that. Um, I wouldn't really no normally use this very often. I have rather large hands and this is just so tiny for me that it's kind of difficult for me to use. Um, the pen loops, eh, you can't really fit a normal size fountain pen in there. They are elastic. So I guess if you really wanted to try to shove one down, you might be able to, Ugh. I mean, yeah, there you go. <laughs> There's a Lamy 2000, but you can see the size difference. But anyway, I just thought this was a really cool system. I felt like a jerk for not reviewing it for so long and having them in my possession without actually having done a video on them. So now I have, this is a video about these notebooks. I think they're great. They are the Der Zettelwert by Offlines. I will put links in the description box below and you should check them out, but now, we don't have any more time. We have to get to ask stuff and things. If you have a question, go to Twitter at SATBradley, hashtag ask stuff and things, and I will try to get back to you on a Sunday smoke. The first one is from L1 Metal Gaming. He says, <clears throat> how's your handwriting? You still practicing? Get any more fountain pens? Um, I'm not sitting around at a desk practicing handwriting really anymore. I should be, but when I write, I still write in the method that I have chosen for myself to write. If you watch my video, how to attempt to improve your handwriting. <coughs> still a little sick. Um, I talk about the methods that I use and I still write in that method. Um, in terms of fountain pens, I haven't gotten anything that I haven't shown you on the channel, I don't think. So the last pen, fountain pen review I've done, I can't remember which one it was, that would be the last pen that I got. All right, Sheldon, at Sheldon Richmond. Um, so far, Bradley, what's the closest match you have found to Elizabethan mixture? I haven't really found anything that's close to Elizabethan. When I was doing that series on, you know, finding a replacement, I wasn't really looking for something that tasted exactly like Elizabethan. I was just looking for something that I liked as much, which I think is still going to be a futile attempt. I don't think I'm ever going to find anything that I like as much as Elizabethan. But um, a lot of people have mentioned, in fact, we have another question here from Grafton. He says, uh, hey Bradley, did you know there are match Elizabethan blends available from Pipes and Cigars and Four Noggins? You should give them a try. I hear they are really good and may serve as a replacement for Dunhill Elizabethan. Hate to hear about the end of Dunhill. Hopefully any, hopefully good news is on the horizon. Yeah, so there's a Sutliff match and then there's, I think there's a different match that's actually made by Pipes and Cigars. I haven't had those yet. Um, I can't order from Pipes and Cigars because I live in Washington. I might eventually try Four Noggins and uh, just check out, especially the Sutliff one people have mentioned a lot. Um, this one is from Dario. He says, what is the difference between tobacco used for cigars and pipe tobacco? Why is there no Cuban pipe tobacco or cigars made from Virginia, Burley, and Cavendish? Um, there are pipe blends that use uh, cigar tobacco in them or cigar leaf. Um, it's just a completely different industry and a different way of curing the tobacco. Um, you're not gonna find Cuban leaf in most pipe blends in the US anyway, because we still have those. Well, actually have those lifted now, the import restrictions? I haven't kept abreast of all that. But when you think of Cuban tobacco or Nicaraguan pipe, or not pipe tobacco, cigar tobacco, um, a lot of the cigars I like are Nicaraguan. The 
and I'm no expert on, on cigars by any means, so everything I say here, take with a grain of salt. Um, from what I understand, the, the leaf is fermented in a certain way that is very much dependent on where it is done. Um, so you'll get cigar leaf. So you, the whole thing with tobacco, where you grow it and how you cure it is why it tastes the way it tastes. And so areas like in Cuba, supposedly that is just prime, a prime place for growing cigar leaf. Um, Nicaragua is supposed to be nice as well. Those varietals taste a certain way because they are grown in certain places and then they are cured in those places in a certain way. Um, cigar leaf just has this really kind of earthy fermented sort of flavor. It is in some pipe tobacco mixes. Um, I'm trying to think of some off the top of my head, like Key Largo, uh, uh, what is that? Billy Bud, I believe by C and D. There are several blends that have cigar leaf thrown in there, um, as a condiment. And then why we don't have pipe blends or pipe tobaccos in cigars. Um, I don't know. I, I assume it's just because people expect cigars to taste a certain way. Um, I thought I heard of some cigars that had some uh, St. James Perique in them, maybe, but I could be wrong. Anyway, I don't, I'm not an expert on that. That was a really limp gesture I just made there. I'm not an expert on cigars, but that's kind of my understanding. Um, Joseph, uh, he contacted me on Twitter. He did not include the hashtag ask stuff and things. Make sure you do include that hashtag if you have a question. It makes it easier for me to pick out your questions. He says, if I bought up a bunch of Dunhill tins, for how long unopened would they remain good? And for bulk, how long would it keep under best conditions? Um, unopened tins that are vacuum sealed, like, uh, well, I don't have any on me right now. These are the American style tins, but these are pretty much the same way. They're vacuum sealed. Um, but the actual metal uh, European style tins, if they have not had their seal broken and they are kept in a place where there is not going to be a lot of moisture so rust can't develop, um, they should last indefinitely, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Um, you just have to make sure they don't get corroded. You have to make sure that um, they're in a fairly stable environment in terms of temperature, not huge swings one way or the other. Um, there is sort of there are sort of diminishing returns. If you've aged a tin for you know 40 years, you might actually lose flavor by that point. Virginias are great up to a certain point, and then. Um, they kind of just plateau out. And then Latakia blends, the Latakia loses a lot of oomph and punch if it's there for years and years and years. So, um, but in terms of actually going bad or anything, they should be fine for decades. This is from Matthew Wenger or Wenger. Can you do a rundown on deer tongue in pipe tobacco? I hear mixed reviews and think you could be, bring a trusted review on blends that contain this odd addition. Um, I still have never had any blend which contains deer tongue. Deer tongue is an odd plant. I don't really know much about it. I know it's supposed to have a very unique, very strange flavor. Um, I'm trying to think of any blends off the top of my head which contain deer tongue. I know I've seen them in the past and have thought about trying them. Was there a Gawith blend? I don't think so. But maybe that's something I'll look into. I'll try to find a blend which contains deer tongue and give it a try. Um, that would probably be a blend which I would smoke in a corn cob because apparently it's really weirdly oddly flavored and could ghost your pipes quite a bit. But gang, I know I've been motoring through all these topics. There were a lot of things to get to. I wanted to point out to tell you that the, uh, the video for the Stuff and Things channel this week, which we'll be posting, will be about my new workstation, my computer editing slash gaming, recording, live streaming, whatever workstation. I was telling some of you that, or all of you, that I had built a new workstation for myself for a multi-monitor setup, and some of you expressed interest in seeing that. So I did a video on that. Because I've been sick this week, um, I didn't really do much pipe smoking, so I don't have a first smoke or a tobacco review for you next week. But look forward to that workstation uh, video, and then there is still the Zelda series ongoing the DLC Champions Ballad on Stuff and Things Plays. So check that out as well. But until next time, until we meet again, like I said, nothing funny in this episode whatsoever. I've been your good friend Bradley. You have been the audience. This has been Stuff and Things. I'll see you later. Nothing funny.